For 50 plus years, the US was a country obsessed with golden lagers. Budweiser, Miller, Pabst, Coors, Heineken. Wait, Heineken? How in the world did a Dutch beer get a strong foothold in the American market that is chock full of large breweries working extremely hard to outcompete one another? Come to think of it, I saw a lot of Heineken taps in the UK and Ireland as well while I was visiting. How in the world did they manage that? Well, Freddie Heineken was an ingenious marketer, and after prohibition on beer was lifted in the United States, he came up with a great idea to get Heineken into American bars. In a time long before the internet, when people still had to rely on cunning sales tactics, physical networking skills, and perseverance, the Amsterdam beer magnet turned down some of the ideas that big advertising companies had proposed, and instead devised a playful marketing strategy of his own. Heineken hired very attractive couples in New York City and paid them a few beers to walk into bars and ask their bartenders if they had any Heineken on hand. After multiple young couples approached them in a week, bar owners were under the impression that Heineken was a very trendy beer, and they were relieved when a Heineken salesman showed up a couple days later. Using some good looking young people to sell was effective, really effective. Within two to three years, bars across America's major cities were all serving the exotic and premium Heineken beer, and Freddy was well on his way to building a beer empire. Heineken must have heard that old marketing adage, sex sells, and although it certainly wasn't old in his day, but the beer industry in the United States has had mixed relationships when it comes to using sex to sell beer. If you look at most of what's written about the use of sexual content in beer advertising, you'd probably get the impression that the industry is just a bunch of dudes sitting around ogling at women and chugging light beers. But the history of how beer marketers have used more sensual content is far more nuanced than this simple first impression. And after doing all the research for this video, it seems that these sort of ads follow an interesting cultural cycle. So today I want to walk through the history of using sex to sell beer, talk about some of the controversy, and with all that knowledge maybe even make some predictions about the future of beer ads. If you're excited to unlock some keys to successful beer marketing, leave a like down below and let's get started. Before we dive into beer, I want to make a couple important points about how I'm going to be looking at these beer ads from a different time period. Take a look at this photo from the early 1970s. This is the album cover to David Bowie's 1971 release, The Man Who Sold the World. Does this photo elicit any strong and immediate reactions from you? Like, are you getting any really strong feelings about this photo? I'm guessing the majority of you, like me, don't have a ton of love or hate for this cover looking at it here on the internet in 2019. Well, this album cover caused an absolute shitstorm of controversy when it went public in 1971. Throwing this message of sexual ambiguity and androgyny into the early 70s UK and US society sent a variety of more conservative oriented groups into an absolute tizzy. Letters to the record company and angry articles in newspapers immediately put pressure on Bowie and Mercury Records to pull this abhorrent image that was clearly trying to corrupt the youth with its terrible sexual deviancy. The company did relent to this hornet's nest of 70s societal angst they stirred up, and replaced the cover with a mediocre black and white photo of Bowie kicking his leg into the air. All this for an image which honestly didn't provoke a strong emotion in me whatsoever. And I'm sure there were many folks today who would say the people of the 70s were dumb or wrong for making such a big deal out of this picture. But what happens a hundred years from now when those people think we're quite stupid for trying to keep up with the Kardashians or something else? That's just the thing. I want to look at these ads as products of their time because the stories and controversies of the period are much more interesting than some 2019 postmodern vicious intellectualist breakdown of why XYZ campaign is problematic to us, the current enlightened generation. Conversations about why a horse and buggy transit system wouldn't work today are boring. I would much rather have the conversation about why society changed and why people chose to move away from horses to get around. 
That is infinitely more interesting to me. So today, I'm going to try to break down these provocative beer ads and talk about why they worked, and what cultural changes caused brewers to rethink their strategies and move away from certain kind of ads. Second, I'm going to approach these ads from the perspective that beer and sex are at least somewhat implicitly linked in the minds of many American consumers. For many who don't spend a lot of time alone in a room recording their thoughts about beer, they associate beer with social settings. Having a beer at a festival or work party is a common experience many people share, and as such, Bud Light runs ads like these to associate their product with an ideally fun social setting full of good-looking people. I believe that same link exists within many consumers' minds for beer and sex, and as such, it's not a surprise that brewers have used idealized sexual imagery to advertise their beer. Now don't get me wrong, this link does not exist for all consumers, and I'm not passing judgment as to whether or not this link is a good or bad thing. For example, my Muslim or Mormon friends probably have no association between sex and alcohol because they abstain from alcohol for religious reasons. And to further complicate things, some people may have a positive association between alcohol and sex, as I've heard many people say they very much enjoy drunk sex, either with their partner or another consenting adult. At the same time, today's media have done a great job of highlighting how the lowering of inhibitions caused by alcohol can cause consensual decisions people regret later, or even worse situations. As such, I think it's important to remember that some people also have a negative connection between alcohol and sex. I'm not really here to argue whether this mental connection is positive or negative, or whether it should or shouldn't exist. And certainly there's a worthy amount of debate to be had on these issues, and perhaps I'll cover that debate in a future video. But today, I'm approaching these ads under the assumption that sex and beer is a connection that already exists in the minds of consumers, and that breweries are reflecting these existing connections rather than subliminally programming people to associate the two, as some of the more conspiratorial channels here on YouTube seem to think. Okay, now it's time to turn our time machines back to the year 1871 so we can find the predecessor to the modern use of sex in advertising. Most people assumed that provocative content really came into fashion in the more free-loving 1960s, but actually, it began nearly a hundred years before that with an extremely risky campaign run by the Pearl Tobacco Company. This poster began being printed, and Pearl Tobacco went about hanging them up around American cities to advertise their cigarettes. Now, I'm censoring this image for YouTube's sake, but this image is very iconic and can be easily found for your own research purposes. Now, for this being what many marketing historians consider the first instance of sexually explicit advertising, a couple of things are really blowing my mind about this ad. First, it amazes me that the person who came up with this ad already knew that it was such a good idea that they didn't even bother to show the product anywhere in the ad. They knew that this idea was so innovative and effective at getting attention, all they needed to do was put the brand name somewhere on the image and the product would sell. No need to mention or show anything related to cigarettes or smoking. Like, they didn't even take the half step that this Heineken ad does and show the product in a way that your brain is likely to connect to a sexual image. No, they just went all the way and just threw the brand name above this provocative image. Second, it's interesting to see how different sexual imagery was over a hundred years ago. This image reminds me much more of a renaissance image of divine femininity, like the birth of Venus and it seems far removed from a late 1980s or 90s bikini model beer ad. It's kind of crazy that something like this was close to the pinnacle of sexual imagery back then, as opposed to all the provocative images we are bombarded with today, to say nothing of the easy and ready access to pornography on the internet. Crazy how much technology and culture has changed. Anyway, I thought it was important to bring up this tobacco ad, as this was the image that really proved to every marketer that connecting your brand with sexual imagery can lead to increased sales. By the 1920s, products from cigarettes and soap were all taking a chance on using some sexual imagery. 
but US beer advertisers weren't really using that effective imagery yet. What gives? I thought beer advertising was all about sexy and fun imagery to sell beer. Well, up until Prohibition in the United States, beer was being advertised as a premium alcoholic product, a higher quality product that was at least within reach of the common man. Not actually all that different from how many craft beers are advertised today. But instead of heady stouts, it was beers like Budweiser and Pabst. If you know your alcohol history in the United States, you know that prior to the invention of consistent and affordable refrigeration, beer was not the most popular alcohol in the United States. That belonged to things like whiskey and rye. Hard liquors were easily stored, more portable, and took up less volume to achieve their desired effects. And this made them the drink of choice over beer, which was much harder to lug around during the US westward expansion. As such, the less commonly available beer was seen as an elevated beverage over moonshines and whiskeys that the common man drank. This elevated market position meant that brewers were hesitant to adopt more sexually suggestive advertising content. Using such a raw and seemingly lowbrow strategy would have undermined the position as an affordable luxury. As such, prior to Prohibition, brewers were much more focused on highlighting the quality of their products rather than using new strategies to grab attention. Now you might think that the flapper age of the 1920s would have been prime time for brewers to pick up some sexier ad concepts, but the 20s was the great experiment in Prohibition in America. And as such, anyone who was brewing was keeping it on the down low and definitely not advertising that fact. However, in foreign markets, their brewers were beginning to experiment with pictures of beautiful women drinking, pouring, and just generally being around beer. Although not very explicit or overt, some of these do lean a little more provocative than in decades past. Once America got over its collective temperance insanity and restored beer's legal status, it allowed the few remaining brewers a wide open marketplace to try and advertise to. It was this situation that Heineken took advantage of to get his beer into American cities using pretty young couples. Many brewers took to advertising technological innovation in beer service that happened since 1920 by talking about how their beer was now in cans or that it was delicious when served ice cold out of a refrigerator. But many brewers built upon the provocative advertising being used in foreign markets. Some were old school, like this Rainier beer ad that used the divine feminine image of decades past to invoke some good feelings about the product. But many US brewers simply turned to what their foreign counterparts were doing at the time, creating ads that featured men with beautiful women in order to associate their products with beauty, much like Heineken did. One thing I do want to point out is the definition of beauty people used back then was a bit different than what we expect today. Take a look at this ad campaign from a women's magazine in the 1930s. This ad shows beer as a viable way to gain a curvy figure, as opposed to today's consensus that beer produces undesirable beer curves. It's kind of strange because it seems that women in the 1930s were getting mixed messages as the exact same magazine was advertising a different product, promoting a healthy way to lose fat. I guess in the end they were still encouraging that hourglass figure, but it's weird to see beer advertised as a health and beauty product in a women's magazine. These ads worked well in the 1930s, but once again, world events would hit the reset button on mass marketing of products in the United States. World War II saw a lot of men head off to war, and a lot of women joined the workforce at home, and post-war it was time for a generation of men and women to settle down and start families. Family values were central to majority culture in America in the 1950s, and with suburban sprawl and nuclear families came beer ads that reflected those values. But family values didn't totally mean stripping away the provocative content that had worked well for the industry in the past. 1950s sexual content was usually a lot more punny and full of innuendo than in decades past. Here's a 1957 Budweiser ad showing a married woman beckoning her husband with some mistletoe and gift wrap while he pours himself a beer. Pretty clear what's going to happen next in this story. And here's another one advertising Lucky Lager, showing a couple on vacation with a great little joke tagline of, get lucky. 
But the industry didn't totally abandon the good-looking women with beer trope. Miller High Life tended to push the envelope with women in provocative positions to get the attention of men throughout the 1950s. Unlike previous eras of using sex to sell beer, though, the ads weren't phased out because of some major political or economic world event. Rather, these sort of ads feel quite out of place to us today because culture had evolved. The free-loving culture of the 1960s, as well as the social unrest and racial tensions that permeated the decade, made ads like this seem optimistically obsolete at best. The suburban nuclear family wasn't the ideal p image most people were seeking any longer, and as such, beer advertisers had to change. The 1970s brought an even greater presence of sexual content into the forefront of pop culture, Remember that sexually androgynous David Bowie album cover we looked at? That was 1971. Minorities of all sorts began greatly influencing US culture, as the majority culture that dominated in the 50s became fragmented, as people became more open and economic uncertainty had people questioning if suburbia was truly the best way to live. Things like sex and tough times were beginning to be televised as opposed to the optimistic shows of decades past. It's also at this time that brewers were consolidating and trying to advertise their product as the everyman drink as opposed to a more premium alcoholic beverage. Sports stars and celebrity TV endorsements were all the rage in beer advertising. But this shift towards a more sexually open culture and big beer companies need to appeal to most men primed the pump for a major shift in tone in the 1980s. Look at this Michelob ad. This is every overly artsy cologne ad that is just churning with raw sexual energy. See, if you want to advertise your product to every man, you gotta pick something that almost every man likes, and women and sex is usually a good place to start. The strangely optimistic decade of the 80s brought with it probably the most raw and objectifying version of women and sex in beer advertising. I think the best way to look at this era of beer ads in the mid 80s and 90s is to tell the story of a sexy beer ad campaign that went beyond a simple series of ads and became a pop cultural phenomena in its own right. I am of course talking about Old Milwaukee's Swedish Bikini Team. In the 60s and 70s, Old Milwaukee was a pretty popular brand, right up there with Schlitz and Paps competing to be every man's favorite beer. But by the 90s, the brand's reputation had become a bit tarnished. It was seen as your father's beer, and also seen as a cheap, low-quality way to get a drunk on. As they continued to lose market share year after year, it was time to take a chance on some more risky advertising to get people talking about the brand again. To come up with a good idea, they called a focus group and got some young men together in a room for some free beers and to talk about what beers they drank and what they liked and how they might turn around Old Milwaukee's aging image. One man expressed that he really enjoyed getting together for a few beers with his buddies, but Old Milwaukee just really wasn't that great of a beer. One of the smarter marketing execs admitted that, yeah, the beer could be better. But then he asked a pretty key open-ended question. If you already have booze and all your buddies together, what would make those situations in life even better? Obviously, sex was the answer after those first two needs were met for young men. So ad execs began to rack their brains on how to make sexy beer ads young and hip again. As we've already seen, beer advertising at the time was already flooded with sexy images, so the team wanted to take a bit of a humorous approach by going absolutely over the top with sexiness. It was a spoof, insisted one marketer, like Monty Python. We were going to have babes in bikinis, but we'd do it in a more absurd way than the other guys who were doing it for real. And thus, the Swedish bikini team was born. Guys, it doesn't get any better than this. Doug Patterson was wrong, because when the shark fin started playing, 
it got somewhat better. And when the Swedish bikini team came surfing by, it got a little better. And when the treasure chest of old Milwaukee washed ashore, it most certainly got better. Old Milwaukee and Old Milwaukee Light. It just doesn't get any better than this. Yeah, the absurdity is definitely there. There isn't some Bud Light ad of today where people would otherwise be in a fun situation and choose to add Bud Light to their evening. No, this was four guys just sitting around and then suddenly they find themselves in the middle of a sweet concert with free beer and, of course, some very beautiful women. So how did Old Milwaukee find this team of mysterious Swedish surfer athletes and convince them to leave their Scandinavian home for a beer commercial? Well, they didn't. No, they just put out a casting call in LA, and after working around some actor strikes, they managed to get five good-looking ladies lined up for the job. Although the characters were given some painfully stereotypical Swedish names, like Ulla Swenson and Hilgar Obleif, the marketing team was a little concerned that their caricature would be too subtle, and people might not consider it a parody of other beer commercials. So they turned up the absurdity dial and gave them all uniforms. They were to wear the same swimsuits and wigs. They gave them a cartoonish vibe that really screamed over the top. What started out as another humorous beer ad quickly turned into something way more popular. Not only did Old Milwaukee get a nice sales boost, but TV Guide called it 1991's version of the Energizer Bunny and polls quickly found it was the second most popular beer ad of all time, behind Miller Lite's great taste, less fulfilling sports campaigns. The group of models instantly became their own pop culture icons. They were given a Playboy cover, and when Fox's primetime sitcom Married With Children called and asked for a cameo, it propelled them into even more American homes. Even The Simpsons got in on the joke throwing a visual gag referencing the group in a 1992 episode. Later, the model who played Ula Swenson would even claim she hooked up with Johnny Depp one time. But just as beer advertising hit peak sexiness and relevance in society, trouble began brewing as well. 1991 was the summer of the Kennedy rape case and that fall was Clarence Thomas's confirmation hearings and this thrust sexual harassment in the workplace straight to the front of the national conversation. In that new context, the Swedish bikini team wasn't a parody anymore. Now many in the nation viewed it as target number one when it came to enforcing some political correctness. Of course, once culture changes that quickly in society, you lose control of your narrative pretty quickly as an advertiser. The last straw came when the female employees at the Stroh Brewery in Minnesota sued Old Milwaukee for cultivating a negative corporate culture. Again, think about that. The ad went from sitcom crossovers to having women at a different brewery suing Old Milwaukee for creating a hostile culture. Whether or not people got the joke of the Swedish bikini team, they had to go. The ad went from wildly successful to pulled off the air in a short span of seven months. Seven months! It's funny how quickly the cultural pendulum can swing sometimes in the digital age, isn't it? Old Milwaukee hastily threw together a more blue-collar oriented ad campaign, but they were back to struggling in the crowded value beer segment until the mid-2000s when hipsters decided the aging brand was super cool again. The Swedish bikini team exemplified the over-sexual nature of beer advertising from the early 80s to the early 90s. But as 90s counterculture began to take hold, people began being more interested in poking fun at established icons rather than celebrating them. Beer ads began to reflect this with a more humorous tone. The events of the 2000s also encouraged more upbeat humor, as Americans collectively processed the dot-com crash, September 11th attacks, and several years later, a housing and financial recession. Finding humor in beer was helpful for many, and resonated with macro and craft drinkers alike at the time. That's not to say sexy beer ads have gone away, they were just usually given a funnier context as opposed to the raw sexual energy of the 80s ads. Great taste, less filling, great 
And that brings us to the 20 teens where we are today. I think you probably know what's going on in ads today. It's the age of the meme and trying to go viral. Pushing for simple and fun ideas you can connect with your brand. That's why Dilly Dilly has been so effective for Bud Light. It's a joke that's easy to share whether you're yelling it across the bar or tweeting it while watching a football game at home. Sexy messages are still effective, but brewers have to be very careful with wording these days. As the country has a well-deserved debate around things like consent and what dating should look like in the digital age when everyone has an iPhone, even a single mistake can be shared millions of times in a matter of hours. Bud Light recently kicked off an ad campaign that included a label on some bottles that featured the slogan, the perfect beer for removing no from your vocabulary for the night. Now, I'm the kind of guy that tends to give people the benefit of the doubt until proven otherwise, so I think it was probably nothing more than a well-meaning attempt to connect Bud Light and saying yes to go out with others rather than staying home in an age of screens and Netflix. But the criticism they received was pretty well deserved in an age where people recognize that consent isn't as simple as we once thought. For their part, Bud Light did immediately pull the offending bottles and apologized for missing the mark, expressing regret over the ill-conceived reinterpretation of their up-for-whatever slogan of a few years earlier. Aside from being careful with wording, one of the areas sexual beer ads and brewers are beginning to explore much more is content aimed at the LGBT community. Now that gay marriage has been accepted by a majority of Americans, brands feel comfortable to explore how they can connect with these groups as well. Here's an early example of a Coors ad with the slogan, Out is Refreshing. Or this very phallic bottle placement in this Bud Light ad. And here's a couple of women getting intimate with a beer in hand as well. I would expect this trend to continue into the next decade as these communities take a more open and represented role in American culture. You know, going through the history of these more sensual beer ads has really made me aware of the cyclical nature of culture and sexual openness and how it's reflected in advertising. While society has generally trended towards more open and candid conversations and even humor around sexual situations. It certainly hasn't been without its ebbs and flows. 1920s saw an open flapper culture that died off with the Depression and World War. Emerging into the 1950s, beer ads reflected the family-oriented ideals of the decade while nodding to some punny sexual undertones. The 60s and 70s brought a free-loving culture and challenge to the status quo that allowed overt sexual ads to thrive in the 80s and 90s. But an increased emphasis on sexual misconduct and the rise of punk counterculture forced brewers to get subtle and use humor to diffuse that cultural tension. And today, more sexual groups and orientations than ever before are being represented in beer advertising. But brewers have never had to be more careful with their wording and their imagery. With the debates around consent and institutionalized cultures and how connected everyone is today, it can take just one message that hasn't been fully thought through to create a PR nightmare. That being said, history tells us that we're likely to see some more skin in beer advertising at some point in the next decade. Probably nothing like the Swedish bikini team, but my guess is it will probably look a little more diverse than in decades past. Regardless of how you felt about all these ads I've shown you today, they were certainly products of their times. So my challenge to you is to think about what you want to say to people who will be looking back 50, 100, or even 200 years from now. Do you want to show them what issues we were thinking about and grappling with today? Or do you want to show them that despite the challenges we're going through, we still aren't taking ourselves too seriously and we still know how to have some fun?
So the next time you see a beer ad on TV or at a sporting event, take a few seconds to think about what it's trying to say and what they want you to feel. That way we can have all sorts of great conversations about our beers and selfishly I get more beer nerds to talk to. Speaking of chatting about beer, let me know what you think of this video down below, good, bad, or otherwise. And if you want to be alerted the next time I have a rant about beer that goes on far too long, be sure to hit that subscribe button. And check the link in the description to the Beer by the Numbers Facebook group. It's a private group of beer nerds having some really great beer related conversations. See, here's me showing a kick-ass Imperial Flight Stout I got the other week. Once again, this has been Ryan with Beer by the Numbers, and I'll see you next time with some more sensual beer content.